What does ethics, democracy, and human flourishing have to do with Buddhism and death, or our most recent theme of attachment? Remember, we cling to certain ideas and push others away. We sometimes kill relationships over our different perspectives on moving forward with democracy. Talk about suffering. Listen and consider what other connections to death, impermanence, and attachment can you find. Hi, it's Margaret Maloney, and welcome to season three of the Death Dhamma podcast. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so appreciative that you are part of my community. And yet, I seek not to be attached to the idea of the podcast or even to the idea of our community. And that's our topic this season attachment, clinging, and aversion. What happens when we really want something? What happens when we really don't want something? And what does it do to our suffering and dissatisfaction? Let's dive in and find out a little bit more with today's episode. Hello, my friend. Prepare to embark on a journey of self-reflection and contemplation as you listen to this thought-provoking episode, Dr. Seth Zwiho Segal calls for an ethical reset and his exploration of the intertwining nature of ethics, democracy, and human flourishing will leave you with a fresh perspective on the world around you. Welcome to a special episode of the Death Dhamma podcast. It's one of our in-between season episodes. And today, and I think this is his third visit with us, Dr. Seth Zwiho Siegel. And he is because he's very generous with his time. And he has recently released, I'm going to say another book because he is well-published uh, he comes from a background in clinical psychology. He's a Zen Buddhist priest. He is an editor with Tricycle. And like I said, he's well published. And the book that I want to mention specifically before I mention this one is his book on flourishing, a modern Western perspective from 2020. And today we're going to actually talk his talk about his new book, The House We Live In, Virtue, Wisdom, and Pluralism. And I feel like that's very deeply connected to the flourishing book. And that's why I mentioned that. But like I said, Dr. Segal is really well published and has many books that are more than worthy of your time. And so on that note, I want to say welcome and see if you would like to add something to that brief introduction. I wouldn't dare add anything to it. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're so kind. Also, by the way, he's like one of the kindest people and the e- one of the easiest people to speak to. So as we get going, one of the things that, you know, I was kind of curious about was what was your inspiration behind pulling this book together? I I guess there were like two main sources of inspiration. The first is my kind of shock and dismay after the 2016 election, uh, realizing that that um, the idea of democracy, which I thought most Americans shared, was currently under threat, and I could imagine situations in which we would lose our uh, our democratic character as a country. So I wanted to be able to talk about what are the what are the the competencies, the kinds of understandings, the kinds of habits and skills that support and allow democracies to flourish and continue. And I wanted to kind of just put in what my two cents about what I think we need to do if we're going to preserve our way of life, a democratic way of life. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that, as you mentioned my earlier book on uh, Buddhism and human flourishing, a modern Western perspective, in that book I compared um, the Buddhist view of uh, an ethical life and a good life Mm -hmm. with the view that Aristotle had of a good life. And I said that both of these, both Buddhism and Aristotelianism were virtue ethics approaches to life. And then in the ensuing years, I realized that the Confucian uh, system was yet another approach to looking at flourishing and virtue and wisdom, and that the three of them overlapped in significant ways. They they were in some ways saying much the same thing. And so I wanted to look at these three ancient approaches to understanding flourishing and virtue Mm -hmm. that grew up in totally different cultures and totally different eras. And I wanted to say, what do they share in common that we can borrow from them? to construct a kind of modern ethics that we can live with today that's suitable for our times. So so those were the, the two main um, impetuses for the book. I see that. And here we sit in 2023, thinking that maybe 
we would have been closer to uh, having that threat to our democracy resolved. And yet based on, you know, and I try so hard to be very careful selectively about what I read and see, but I think it's still important to stay informed. It's still a threat. I feel like we are still at risk. And, you know, so here we are. And so definitely. um, And really, really it's always at risk. I mean, (laughs) I guess that's a, a good point, right? I mean, the, you know, Athens su- survived for a while as a democracy, and 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 then the demo- and then it collapsed. Okay, I mean, mm-hmm. the Roman Empire existed as a republic for a while, and then became an empire instead. And um, I mean, during the Civil War, democracy was threatened. During McCarthyism, you know, democracy mm-hmm. was threatened. I mean, there's always a constant renewed threat to it, and there's always a kind of way that we have to renew our commitment to it. It's like a long-term relationship. We have to keep renewing our commitment to it every day. That's right. Yeah. If that's, that's what if that's what we want. And I think maybe the challenges that we're seeing or we're wondering is we, you and I might know what we want, but do we, the we of the United States, do we all want the same thing? And I would add, I would say at this point, the answer is no, we don't. No, we don't. We no. do not. And, in fact, and that's why I have the word pluralism in the title of the book, because we live in a in a world in which people have very different ideas of what the good life looks like have very different ideas about what the virtues are that uh, enable it to occur and ha- have different goals in life, different visions of, of what they want the country to become. Mm-hmm. Somehow we have to find a way to all live together despite our diversity and differences and come to compromises and come to um, come to solutions that allow all of us, if not always to be happy, at least to live together. So that's always a challenge. Yes, no. I agree. I agree. How does flourishing-based ethics enter into this? What do you mean by flourishing-based ethics? Okay, well, first I have to say a word about what I mean by flourishing. And flourishing is my particular vision of the kind of life I would ideally like to live. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of life I want my children and grandchildren to have. It's what I wish for my friends. So what is it that I wish for myself and my friends and the people I love and for other people living in, in our modern world. This, uh, so we, this kind of vision I have may not be the kind of vision of flourishing in different kinds of societies, but certainly in kind of modern societies, what is that vision like? And and for me, it means a couple of things. One is I want my life to be emotionally satisfying. Mm-hmm. I want it to be meaningful. In other words, I want to feel like my life has some value for the other people around me, that it matters whether I lived or not to the people I care about. Um, it means I want to be somewhat competent at a variety of things that I care about. I want to be able to have some accomplishments in life. They don't have to be huge accomplishments, but they have to be accomplishments in areas that I that I deeply care about. Third, I want to be able to appreciate beauty and uh, and uh, and harmony and all the good things of aesthetics. You know, I want to be able to appreciate a sunset and a rainbow and appreciate yeah. a flower garden. I want to enjoy those best. I want to be capable of enjoying those aspects of my life. Um, I also, um, I also want to feel like I'm really present in my life, fully mm-hmm. present. So I, so I call that quality wholeheartedness. I don't want to be standing back from life and looking at it from some distance. I want to be engaged when I'm with people. I want to be really with them, you know, and not just side by side with them in some kind of way. Mm-hmm. So that kind of wholeheartedness is important for me. So those are all different. Qual- I, I also want to be somewhat resilient. I mean, there are a lot of bad things that happen in life to all of us. Right. And we want to be able somehow to move on when those things happen and not be destroyed by them. So those are all qualities that I think are important parts of what I mean by flourishing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know from you know our previous conversations that this has become a major theme, if not the theme in your life. You know, it's what you teach us and it's what you talk about and it's it's how you live. Right. It's how I attempt to live anyway. Don't always succeed at it. Well, we're only all just human. So there's that. <laughs> it's always that. So, always. so then you have to say, well, what enables people to flourish? What enables yes. them to not just survive in life, but actually have a life that's meaningful and satisfying in important ways? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that the classical virtues and classical ideas of wisdom are very important to that. And that's that's one thing that all the ancients, you know, Aristotle, the Buddha and Confucius all agreed on is that there are certain virtues and certain kinds of wisdom that enhance one's ability to live that kind of life. So Aristotle would say that, you know, an ideal life is, in fact, a virtuous and wise life. Okay. And so coming back to flourishing-based ethics, Mm -hmm. 
tie that together for me, please. Okay. Well, we say that I say at the night that there are a group of virtues. Mm -hmm. If we engage in them, are they're probabilistically tied to having a better life. And in fact, they also characterize part of what a better life is like. Mm -hmm. So we can say that being a compassionate person enables one to live a better life. But also, if we say you're a better person, what is a better person like? Well, a better person is compassionate. So there's a way that the path to a flourishing life also is part of what constitutes a flourishing life as well. Mm -hmm. So if we look at what those virtues are, things like honesty or courage or the ability to restrain one's emotions and, and temperaments mm -hmm. or the ability to um, to be fair to other people, for example, these are all examples of some of the virtues I deal with. Yes. Um, they're all tied to the year of flourishing. So, so flourishing based ethics means we engage in these things because they help us to live better lives and they also help society to be a better society as well. Okay. And so now you, you've also kind of issued a call, if I can say it that way, a call for ethical renewal. Mm -hmm. And is that because of where we are now and that perhaps we aren't following these values or is it like we need to press the reset button? Well, it's, it's a whole bunch of things. I mean, first of all, many of the problems that we're facing right now are actually solvable problems and you can think of simple solutions for them. For example, uh, look at, look at gun deaths, you know, mass shootings in the United States. Right. We could ban AR-15s. We could take away automatic weapons the way Australia did, for example. Right. It's possible to do that, but we can't do it because we don't have an agreement among most of the people, the majority of people in this country, that that would be the right and ethical thing to do. So many of the problems we could solve global warming if we agreed to things like carbon taxes and so forth, but we can't agree on that. Um, we can solve inequality in this country if we could look at a more progressive taxation system, but we can't agree on that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think solving the problems doesn't mean coming up with new solutions. It means coming up with some kind of ethical agreement about what our society really ought to be like. And I think part of the problem with the culture we live in, mm -hmm. different from problems that other cultures, every culture has its problems. But part of our problem is that we've, over the last Western culture, over the last 500 years or so, has cultivated the idea of individualism <laughs> that ignores our mutual responsibilities towards each other. So, for example, Americans died at 10 times the rate that Australians did of COVID. Okay. And the reason is, we, we, it was our right not to wear a mask. That's individual freedom. Yes. Whereas, for example, people in Japan or Korea or Taiwan or all throughout the Confucian world mm -hmm. wore masks because they saw that as their responsibilities to other people. So we have to kind of, in some ways, rebalance our view of what ethics is. That it has to balance. It's great that we believe in individual freedom. We have, it's important that we do. The, the Chinese right now don't believe it, and it's a disaster for them, I think. Mm -hmm. But we have to find some way to balance these two and, and compromise between these two and make that part of our daily practice of how we understand ethics. Okay. Um, okay. That's part of it. The other thing is that we have all these, all these signs right now that we're actually doing quite poorly uh, as a society and as a culture. So, for example, we look at the rate of depression, anxiety, and loneliness in young people today. It's extraordinary. And it keeps on increasing year by year by year. Oh, my we gosh. And, and I'm just going to interject. And the fact that uh, is it in New York that we've appoint that there, we've appointed somebody in charge of the loneliness? Uh, yes. Dr. Yes. Ruth is, is going to help uh, with the loneliness epidemic. And I mean, so that tells you something right there. I, I may not be saying that correctly, but. Yeah, but it's a measure of where we are. Yes. We can talk about the deaths from opioids, alcoholism, and suicide among middle-aged white people, for example. Mm -hmm. There's an article right now that for men, men die six years younger than women right now. Mm -hmm. um, that that increased over the last couple of years because men are more likely to die from homicide, suicide, and drug overdose. And they're more likely to die from COVID than women because they're less likely to get vaccinated, for example. Ah, okay. We can talk about the way that 50% of American parents no longer want their children to go to college. We can talk about the fact that men are, are going to college, applying to, uh, going to and graduating from college in fewer and fewer numbers. You know, we can talk about the gun deaths. We can talk about all the issues that are, you know, we can talk about the political polarization. Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans will no longer marry each other. Only only 3% of marriages in the last year were intermarriages between Republicans and Democrats. As a single person, I see that and I will just, without getting to it, I, I work with that all the time and I'm working with myself to say like, 
Now, mm-hmm. maybe behind the way you two are voting, there might be some core values and you really need to talk about this, but it's hard. It can be hard depending. And I realize in myself, I have to recognize that maybe I'm being closed minded and divisive and I need to really understand why somebody feels a certain way. So I, I, completely understand that one yeah yeah it's it's not that we it's not that we don't disagree about very important things we do and those are contentious and difficult but on the other hand we also demonize each other right we don't we don't give each other our humanity and that there are reasons why we feel and think the way that we do Mm -hmm. and when we try to talk to each other we argue with each other instead of trying to understand each other so i mean that's a fundamental mistake about how to do things arguments never change people's minds (laughs) exactly exactly and I, i actually had a similar discussion uh, with a friend recently. We disagree on um, something, a major event that's happening right now. And I asked her to stop sending me some specific videos because I felt that they were propaganda. And I just was trying to say like, I don't share this opinion and sending these to me isn't gonna change my mind. And her response was to send more and more objectionable to me videos where I had to finally say like, please, I asked you politely, please stop. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. So I know that there's nothing that, for example, a Donald Trump supporter could say to me Mm -hmm. that would make me change my mind about Donald Trump and think he's a really fine human being. But I also know there's nothing I can say to somebody who believes that uh, Donald Trump is is the fulfillment of a biblical prophecy and is the Messiah who's going to save us. Mm-hmm. That I can say to them that's going to make them think differently about it. And I, I, what I want to be careful about is not to label that person as an overall bad person in every aspect of their lives, because many mm-hmm. of them are good parents. They they participate in school bake sales. You know, they coach, you know, ch- um, school, you know, basketball teams and baseball teams. They they pay their taxes. You know, they they run businesses in which they don't cheat other people. Right. Many of them are decent people in most aspects of their lives. And you know, we ought to afford them their humanity, even though we strongly disagree with them. It's it's uh, there's a thing I say to one of my friend's children, which is none of us are 100 percent good and none of us are 100 percent bad. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I am at this point where I'm so tired of the divisiveness that, you know, I don't even want to have too much discussion. If I understand that somebody's coming from a different perspective, I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to keep coming from my perspective because it's, I believe it's exactly what you said. Like, I'm not going to change their mind. They're not going to change mine. And in that act of trying to convince each other, we're probably just going to alienate one another. And is that necessary? Is it necessary? Is it necessary? And if you want to have a conversation with someone from, in quotes, the other side, okay, mm-hmm. then the first question is to assess, do, do, do you both really want to have that conversation? In other words, are we both willing to hear each other out all the way and not try to convince each other, but just explain the reasons why we feel and think the way we do yes. just, just so that we can gain that kind of perspective. If, if someone is genuinely interested in engaging in that and sharing that, then let's go ahead and have that conversation. If they're not, if they're only into this to bully you or to belittle you or to score points, then there's, there's no point in having that conversation. That's not a conversation. Mm-hmm. Which is true. Really putting this aside, which is true in relationships, friendships, uh, romantic partnerships, business partnerships. If we listen to really understand as opposed to listen so that I can score a debate point, you know, it's it's so important to listen to understand and not try to score that debate point. And yeah. to understand this is and that it's natural that we don't all agree on things. Mm-hmm. The real question is, can we settle these differences in ways that don't involve killing each other? You know. Yeah. Yes. And, and, yes. And we've had all kinds of issues in the past that have been very divisive that we've solved. You know, um, I mean, we women were given the right to vote, and it didn't mean killing anyone to accomplish that. Even though, even though a country had to change its mind about that. Right. The whole country, most of the country, seventy percent of the countries, accept the idea that that. Um, homosexuals have a right to exist and live and not be persecuted in the world. Mm-hmm. They, have, they have rights that need to be protected. That we, it took us maybe 50 years to reach that consensus, but we did. Yeah. Um, we had, we, we, we had a fight with Mormons over, they could engage in plural marriage before you took a join the union. We settled right. that without going to war, you know? Um, and there were all kinds of questions like that that come up all the time, you know? Um, mm-hmm. 
and many of the times we do settle them. It may take a while to, and there may be you know vicious, uh, very vociferous debates about them for a time, but eventually we move on and new issues come up. And and so you know that's the question: can we can we agree on some means to settle it that that the majority will get to decide within certain limits because the majority can't run roughshod over minorities either. Exactly. Because, you know, there's some way to kind of resolve these that's part of our political system, as our value system. So here we are back again, really, in this, we are in this relationship together here, all of us in this country and in this world. Mm-hmm. And and so to look at that, you've brought together, as you said earlier, you know, Aristotle, uh, Buddha, Confucius, and, you know, you've pulled out these common threads or themes of, you know, courage, benevolence, conscientiousness, equanimity, truthfulness, justice. I hope I haven't missed one. And, you know, I, I feel like you're pulling these out and saying, like, in these different ways, we have these common threads. Um, first, let's just stop and see if I'm expressing that correctly. And then let's see, let's move forward with that thought in the correct way. Okay. Well, the, the, for me, the main common threads of this that all, all of those three historical figures believe that there are higher levels of flourishing, that there's mm-hmm. something better than just living and surviving that we can aspire to. There's a better way of life for human beings or a higher way of life. And they all agree that wisdom and virtue are the way to get there. Mm-hmm. And they all agree that the way that one becomes more virtuous is by practicing virtue, by study, by practice, by emulation of you know, ideal figures and so forth. They, they all agree on there's a certain way to get there. Okay. And they also agree on at least some of those common traits that that kind of a, a general beneficence to human beings, goodwill towards men, for example, mm-hmm. is one of those characteristics, or that being truthful in situations that call for honesty mm-hmm. is important, or having the courage to not waver when you're sure that something is right and to be able to articulate your why you believe that's true, being able to defend people who are being treated unfairly. I mean, all those are part of what we mean by, you know, and, and the society depends on that. It depends on firemen and policemen and first responders being courageous, for example. Uh, it depends on judges being honest and policemen being honest. I mean, the whole texture of society and our ability to work together depends on our honoring these virtues. So they, I think, I think all of them kind of recognize this importance. And when you're saying that depends on, um, that's trust. It's all trust. Trust. That's right. You have to be able to trust <laughs> that other people are trustworthy, <laughs> and that they're okay. they're they're going to take what you have, to, how you feel, and what's important to you into their consideration. Mm-hmm. Not that they can agree with you, but that at least they'll seriously consider your point of view in some kind of way. Okay. So if we have. You know, so using these three different systems as our reference point, as a framework, and then finding these commonalities. And yet, maybe because I am a Buddhist, I might arrive at what it means, uh, equanimity especially, I might arrive at what that means in a different way than uh, somebody who is, you know, coming from Confucianism. Do we need to resolve that? How do we resolve that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm still not sure of the question. Can you can you say it another way? Yes, thank you. Uh, what I'm saying is, if we share these things like con, like uh, conscientiousness and equanimity, justice, truthfulness, is it possible though that they look different across the systems? Like, does equanimity look different to me as a Buddhist than it does if you are engaged in Aristotle and? Um, analysis or if you're um yeah there, there there are some differences as well so that for example buddhists would really really stress compassion and humility for example which are not things that aristotle particularly stresses he he stresses filio what's really friendliness mm-hmm. kind of a will but but um he doesn't he doesn't elevate it above everything else the way buddhists will elevate compassion above everything else or the way that the confucians will elevate human heartedness and benevolence above everything else so there are differences in the systems. Um, how do we resolve it? And then there are other problems too. I mean, if you if you're saying what's fair, we believe in justice and fairness. There can be a lot of different opinions about what's just and fair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And everyone can say, well, I believe in fairness, but they have a different view of what fairness might might be in this particular situation. And that's the point I'm striving towards. So thank you, Seth. I'm striving toward the point of even if we feel like we share some of these common threads, common themes, common ideas. It's when we get to the root of them, it might mean something different 
Like mm-hmm. I might express fairness differently. And so how do we, how do we work with that? How do we work with that? Well, you, you, in an ideal situation, you work with it by people freely talking about and sharing their opinion mm-hmm. with each other, not vilifying each other, but explaining why they think the way they do it. And I think it's true that as we listen to more voices, we generally enlarge our sense of what fairness is. Okay. And that I think that the idea of what's fair is always being transformed by listening to voices that were excluded earlier from the conversation. Okay. So I think I think we have that kind of moral responsibility not to agree with everyone's position, but to realize there are other positions and to take them under consideration too. Is there something I have to learn from these people that I've neglected? In the past, okay. when I thought about my idea of fairness, and I, and I feel like we've been discussing this all along, but just mm-hmm. to kind of bring it back to the discussion again. So, how do we move forward with this divisiveness with our friends and families and coworkers? And is there ever a point where we draw a line and stay away from those with whom we can't seem to find common ground? Well, again, I think it's whether that those people that we can't find common ground, whether we can at least agree that we're both human and, and, and allow ourselves our differences. For example, you know, in the Northeast of this country, we have a lot of people who are Amish people. They mm-hmm. don't believe in driving motor cars. They drive you know, horse and buggies. Okay? okay. They have a different view of what a good life is than I have. I'm happy to, I don't want a horse. I want a motor car. Yeah. Right. The thing is we allow each other to have our different opinions. We don't insist that the Amish drive motor cars and the Amish don't insist that I drive, you know, horse and buggy, you know, we, okay. Find some way to live side by side. Or in New York, where I live, there are large um, ultra orthodox Hasidic, you know, religious communities. They have a very different view about uh, what the good life is than I have. I mean, I I believe in things like science and uh, and um, cosmopolitan literature and you know, mm-hmm. modern art and so forth. And they believe in staying off the internet. You know, they want kosher uh, phones that can't go onto the internet and so forth. And they, they don't want to learn English. They want to learn Yiddish, you know, and they don't want to study science. They want to study the Talmud and the Torah. Okay. Okay. Can I allow them to have their lives? They don't insist, as long as they don't insist that I can't go on the internet and then I have to follow, you know, ancient, you know, uh, halakha, Jewish laws. Mm-hmm. I'm, happy, I'm happy. Sometimes there's a clash. Okay? Yes. There's, there's a question about, can yeshivas get uh, get federal money if they don't teach secular subjects, for example, or or when the number of Hasidim in a small village over, overcomes the number that were previously there and they get to control the school system, for example, there are mm-hmm. questions that arise then. So it's not that we live harmoniously together in every way, but for the most part, we say live and let live, you know. Right. Uh, and, and the more we can do that, the better off we are. The question is, how much can we do that in the United States? If, if Mississippi, people in Mississippi, for the most part, want to live one way, uh-huh. and people in California New York want, for the most part, live another way, can we allow that to a certain extent? Do we, right. do we all agree on everything? Uh, is it possible that some states will want to enshrine abortion in their constitution as a right, and others will want to ban it in their constitutions? Is, can we live together despite that? Um, and there, those are important questions. I, I know that maybe 40% of the people in Mississippi don't agree with the majority. Mm-hmm. And maybe 40% would like to have legal abortions in the state. And and so living in a state that outlaws it is very cruel to the women who have to go through unwanted pregnancies in those situations. So mm-hmm. we can say, I don't approve of what Mississippi is doing. I will continue to encourage people in Mississippi to rethink that. But can I allow it or not? Or do we all have to agree on everything? That's... That's an undecided question, an open question. And um, what things do we have to fight over and what things can we just disagree about and let people go their own way on? And do you think this is an ongoing challenge for all countries and all peoples? Or is it sure. because we are in a certain place as a still compared to the rest of the globe, a relatively you know, newish, youngish country? Sometimes I think we're just like rebellious teenagers right now and we're just fighting. Um, so is there... How, how long does this continue? Or is it always this way? Is there a place you look at where you say like, well, one day maybe we'll be like, fill in the blank. We'll never be there. <laughs> okay. I mean, look at, look at history. It's not an encouraging story. It's not right. the story of things getting better and better and better all the time. Um, so uh, Russia and China are two other countries that have large ethnic minorities, you know, within their borders. Mm-hmm. And how well are they doing with that? I mean, we can look at the million Uyghurs 
who are in concentration camps in China right now, or the suppression yeah. of the Tibetan people in China. Yeah. You know, I think every country is having this difficulty about how much pluralism and diversity do they allow versus how much does everyone have, you know, how much do we all have to agree on certain things? And I don't think that process ever ends. I don't think there's ever been a community where everyone agreed on what the good life was and didn't have to negotiate these kinds of differences. That makes sense. So this is an ongoing dynamic process. It's it's part of being human in this world. But if you wanted to create a map or some steps for us to move forward, what would that look like? Ah, what a good question. I I think so. Here's this is another core idea in the book that we haven't touched on. Mm -hmm. The idea of understanding what morality means in any particular age is a result of the ongoing social conversation and inquiry. Mm -hmm. The idea of what's right and wrong is always changing as you go through history and not in a permanent kind of way, but just, just for now. Mm -hmm. So um, we can think about the way rules of sexual consent are changing right now, or the way the internet and AI is changing our view of the right to privacy in certain kinds of ways. Or we can talk about how during the Revolutionary War period, when the only weapon around was a single loaded, single front loaded musket, and a lot of people lived on the frontier and hunted and so forth, everyone having a gun made perfect sense. An idea when we've invented automatic weapons, maybe that doesn't make sense without some change. So social conditions are always changing and requiring us to rethink things. And the only way we continue to do this is by continuing to talk about it and uh, negotiate it. And sometimes it'll take 50, 75, 100 years before an issue actually gets worked out in society. Okay, the first American president to uh, propose national health care was Woodrow Wilson. Okay. But it, was, but it wasn't until Medicare and Obamacare that we partially got there. We still haven't fully gotten there. Or we can talk about the way that it took the Civil War to free slaves. That was, that was a country, that was an issue that couldn't be negotiated. Right. Peacefully. Right. Uh, and that we're still not in a place of total equality between the races in this country, even though, even though you know, 100, 200 years have passed since then. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about the women's fight for equality in society and how we can talk about how that begins with you know, the Seneca Falls Convention in the 1840s and women get the right to vote in 1920, but we're still not there at equality. That's a continuing discussion about what does equality mean now. Mm -hmm. We can talk about uh, transgender rights right now. Mm -hmm. And how we're going through a major change in terms of how do people feel and think about that. And we can talk about the demographic change that the country is going through right now. I was reading an article on Texas that pointed out that English speaking whites are now a minority in Texas. Right. You know, that a third of the children's Texas school systems are Asian right now and so forth. So we're always changing and then we always have to rethink things. So we came up with the idea of um, having a, uh, affirmative action in schools to equalize opportunities for blacks and whites. And now we're discussing, now we're discovering when there's a larger Asian population that the Asian population feels that some of these efforts are excluding Asians from schools. Mm -hmm. and we have to rethink it again. But th the important thing is there's always this ongoing willingness to examine things again, to inquire, to question, and, and then to look at the, the, the old rules we arrived at, are they, are they still serving us well? And I think part of the battle that's going on in our country right now is that there are groups of people who are willing to kind of rethink and look at things, given the changes that are going on. Mm -hmm. And other groups that say, no, uh, what's right and wrong is written in the Bible and it's always the same and it never changes, you know. Yes. And so people and, you know, you have to have some charity for people who say, you know, my ancestors have lived this way. Everyone in my community lives this way or most everyone does. Right. This is the way things have been since time immemorial. And I don't know if I agree with all these changes that people are suggesting. I mean, it's a reasonable response to changing situations. And we can talk about how the rate of change right now because of technology is so great and the mobility yes. people so that it's hard for people to adjust to it. And I suppose on some level that may lead some people to dig in a little bit more because so many things around us are changing quickly and we have access to so much, you might even say too much information every day that I could see where that might make some of us, you know, move forward for lack of a better term or not move forward, but accept new different things. And it might make others of us really dig our heels in more and say, wait, stop. This is too much. Yeah. Absolutely. And yet somehow we all have to move forward together. 
Well, you do, we don't all move forward together. We, we move forward haltingly, sometimes two steps yeah. forward, sometimes one step back. But that's that's history, you know. Uh, and what do we gain by chastising people who are holding on to their old ways by saying, calling them all kinds of names? You know, you're a, you're, um, a white supremacist, you're a racist, you're a homophobe, you're, you know, you're mm-hmm. a religious fanatic, you know. Those are demeaning terms for people who are believing what all, most Americans believed, most white Americans anyway, when when and white Protestant Americans, when white Protestants were the majority in this country, mm-hmm. they're holding on to an old way of life. And I think we ought to have some charity for for that, you know, wanting to hold on to something in the way. We can't allow that to determine where we end up in the end, but we can have some charity for it. And the compassion, there's, there's that compassion. Mm-hmm. Now, we have touched on just the tip of the iceberg, I feel like, in of the ideas in your book. And perhaps there are some other things that I haven't asked you about that you would like to make sure that we share or that you discuss. And I would like to give you that opportunity. Well, yeah, I, I think I think I also want to respond to this whole um, movement, both on the left and right, to create safe spaces or to ban certain kinds of topics from conversation or to ostracize people who have certain points of view. Mm-hmm. And um, and that I think that we have to take a more reasonable approach to things. That that most of the things that we believe, people in the future will look back at us and say, "How did they believe that?" I, I get that. Sure, sure. And, and we're probably wrong about a lot of things we believe, but yes. but that doesn't make us evil or despicable people because we're wrong. Okay, um, most people get a lot of things wrong. I mean, that's what being human and to err is human, right? Mm-hmm. I think we have to have some charity for other people that we have to allow a space for the fact that people might have said something 15, 20, 30 years ago somewhere and something they wrote or something that, that we wouldn't approve of today. Right. Uh, you know, um, I can think about what I was like as a teenager, as a pre-adolescent and the kinds of humor that we shared in our peer group, you know. Oh, right. I can look back to it. Jokes I told and went and go, oh, face palm. That's right. That's right. Uh, so we can think about all the homophobic jokes or the, remember the Polish jokes were there was a certain age in the. My the, dad the, and his best friend used to trade Polish jokes. And I, you know, and I, I didn't understand why they were supposed to be funny. And now I don't understand why they did it. <laughs> but yes, no, but, but, but there's, you know, there, there are we're all prisoners of our time. To yes. And um, I think we got to be careful about outing people or. Uh, I think I think that all of the great people who have contributed to Western culture, most of them were horrible people in a lot of ways. You know, Richard Wagner wrote these great operas and he was his despicable anti-Semite, you know. Um, um, Philip Roth is maybe one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, but he had retrograde views about women and, and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pablo Picasso was a great artist, but he treated the women his life terribly. Mm-hmm. We can talk about, we can like Gauguin's paintings and realize that he was having sex with teenagers in Polynesia, you know. So we, we can, Woody Allen can make a movie we still think is funny, and yet we can worry about the kinds of relationships he's had within his family, you know, right. and some of the ways he feels about things. Why isn't it, we, with all our friends, with all my friends, uh-huh. and all my loved ones, there are things I, I think are great about them, and there are things they can, ways they could improve, <laughs> you know. Um why can't we have the same view about the people who contribute to our culture too, that they can be right in some ways and wrong in others, that, that Thomas Jefferson contributed something great when he wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was a slaveholder, you know? Yes. Why do we have to feel one way about people? Um, why do we have to cancel? Why do we have to do this cancel culture thing? One of my uh, friend's children recently was expressing that she had to cancel her favorite singer now because they don't agree about something and i'm like no you like her for her music yeah. you don't need to care about her political views do you well you if don't have you to like a song you like a song right yeah so so i so i think that's a whole quality of our there's a kind of a purest quality in our culture that you have to be you have to be cleansed of all sins mm-hmm. all your past statements and actions and current statements and actions or else you're not worthy to be you know taken seriously as an artist or as a human being or and I think that's, uh, I think we may have to move away from this kind of puritanism. I'll yeah. call it that. Okay. You know? Because that goes back to, again, none of us is 100% good and none of us are 100% bad. Yeah. And and when I look at all of my cultural heroes, mm-hmm. the people, they, they weren't all that great in everything they did. 
you know, we can talk about Martin Luther King's affairs, or we can talk right. about uh, Mohandas Gandhi and how his how he failed to kind of really step in and protecting the Muslim population during mm -hmm. the time of the partition. And you can go down every great person in history and find things that they didn't write. Um, Frederick Douglass, who is one of my really great heroes. I, I mean, I, I read a long biography recently and I read all his speeches and his mm -hmm. biography. What an amazing, probably one of the most amazing people in the 19th century. And yet he talked about how American Indians could never get citizenship here. They weren't like blacks. They weren't civilized, you know. Um, nope, we're all prisoners of our time. We're all right and wrong about some things. And there's, there's no one who, to say this isn't to say that our Idols have feet of clay. It's to say we're all human. Right. You know, why do we expect more? We, we encourage people to, to rise up and be better, but to expect them to do so is, uh, is a bar too high for ourselves or for anyone else. Exactly. That, thank you so much. Because why should I expect someone to be able to be better at being human than I am? And do I really think that I'm that great that I'm that perfect because I think, you know, I have to really let go of my ego and, and, and go, no, you're not. I'm not perfect in every encounter and I'm not going to be. And you're right. And so why do I expect everyone else to be? Or why would I expect that? What other thought would you like to leave us with? I also wanted to, there's a, there's a book on ancient Chinese culture mm -hmm. by a scholar who, uh, is also, I think, in some ways, a friend of mine, although we've never met personally, by the name of Tao Zhang. But he was writing about all the different philosophies back during what's called the Warring uh, States Age in China. Okay. And there were many different philosophies. That there, was, there was Taoism that arose then, there was Confucianism, there was legalism. There were, there were 100 schools of philosophy. They called them the Baijia, the 100 schools. Hmm. And he says that if you look at all those schools, they're really in conversation with each other about the same problem. Almost all of them are in there. It's this. It has to do with what we mean by what is the group of people we really care about? Who do we really want to be fair to and need to be fair to? And, and what they say is that, well, what, what I conclude is that, is that there's a natural tendency to say, there's my group, my family, my loved ones, my friends, my tribe, my profession, you know, the, all the things we identify with. These are my people, you know. Yes, yes. And, and it's natural to kind of extend a natural goodwill to everyone within your group. And then there's everybody else in society. And we also believe, well, as, as it says in the, in the good book, you know, that we ought to extend goodwill to all human beings, right? But there's a conflict between us and that when times are flush and times are good, we're able to be generous to everybody. But when times are scarce or hard, there's a tendency to draw in the wagons, you know, in the circle and say, my family first. And I'm sorry for what has happened to you, but I don't have enough compassion left over for you too. Right. So, so there is what we owe to our families and what we owe to larger society. And there's a kind of a conflict in us, in every human heart, I think about that. So, for example, I think Buddhism is wrong when it says we ought to love everyone equally, because I think that's impossible. I can't love the insurance salesman down the street the same way I love my child. You know? no, no, of course not. I'm, I'm, that wouldn't have allowed you to raise your child either. And. So, so we're going to love certain people more than others just because we see them every day and they're in our lives and they do good things for us. And, and we just naturally, naturally care about them more biologically almost, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there are these other people that we realize we have certain responsibilities to too, but it doesn't come quite as naturally. And especially if they think differently than we do or live far away from where we are, you know. Um, we, we think, well, yeah, we owe them something, but what do we owe them really? So... The Confucians talked about how it's our job. Well, yes, you love your family first, and love is born within the family. But that we have to learn, the, the word they use was extend. You have to learn to extend the way you feel a family to other people as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to do. It doesn't come 100% naturally to us as human beings. So we have various resources in the different religions to help us with that. There are, there are narratives like the Good Samaritan story, the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. that suggests that we owe things you know, to other people as well. Um, or it says in the Bible, uh, I can't remember how many times, 24, 29 times, the Old Testament, it says, love the stranger, right? Yes. It doesn't say love your neighbor. It says love the stranger. The New Testament says love your neighbor, you know, but mm -hmm. the question is whether we're able to do that. We're able to make that move from a, a kind of universal caring and responsibility for everyone from our partial caring for those who are members of our in-group. And that's, 
I, I think that's behind so many of the difficulties we have is how hard it is sometimes to extend that goodwill to people who seem outside our ego boundary, who seem different in some kind of way because they have a different religion or a different ethnicity or a different color or a different political belief. Mm -hmm. But I think it's always our struggle. Can we extend goodwill and fairness? Yeah. And that yeah. includes, you know, the group said it's very hard to. It's, it's hard to extend it, for example, to people in prisons, you know. And yet that's one of the great scandals of our culture that we don't consider prisoners as having individual dignity that has to be respected, you know. Well, I've seen that. I will say quickly that I volunteer with a group where uh, we do go and do some uh, meditation in prison. And it's interesting who will support this nonprofit and who will not. And some people will not because they don't believe it's a worthy enough cause or that it's even, and, and, and I am talking about some other Buddhist perspectives that it's not worthy of trying to help someone who has bad karma. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an interesting. And, and yet aren't the people with bad karma, the people who need the most help. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes, exactly. I just want to thank you so much for being here again on the Death Dhamma podcast. And I'm always appreciative and I always learn from speaking to you. And I know that others do too. And uh, thank you so much. And the book, everyone, The House We Live In, Virtue, Wisdom, and Pluralism, which has lots of great wisdom and food for thought and and help, I think help. In a, in a time of divisiveness and some ideas on you know, how to move forward and, and, and how and how to keep moving on. Thank as you. Thanks Thank so you much. For having me. It's, a pleasure, it's a pleasure to share these ideas with you and your audience. Uh, always, always a joy to talk to you. I hope that you will continue to be well and happy and flourish and flourish. Thank you. I would love to hear from you, your thoughts, your suggestions, your own stories about attachment. So follow this link, I'm going to read it to you in a minute here, to leave me a 90-second message with your ideas and suggestions. You can go to https colon forward slash forward slash www.speakpipe.com forward slash death underscore dhamma underscore podcast. I suppose you could also just use your favorite search engine to say speakpipe death dhamma podcast and there you can record an audio message for me and be sure to come over to margaretmaloney.com that's m-a-r-g-a-r-e-t-m-e-l-o-n-i.com and join the community you've been listening to the death dhamma podcast with your host margaret maloney thank you so much for being here come find me on margaretmaloney.com m-a-r-g-a-r-e-t-m-e-l oni.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.